tonight's Top Gear, Rover's vital new model, the 200, takes to the roads. Police driving under examination as the death toll continues to rise. And the painstaking process of testing a sports prototype racing car. Hello and welcome to Motor Fair, bigger, brighter and more crowded than ever this year and strongly endorsed by the industry with three major new British cars being launched here. We should be looking at those cars away from the show, but we shall at least be getting a glimpse of the other tempting items on offer here. If we don't get round to your particular interest, don't worry, we've got two other programmes coming from Motor Fair tomorrow evening on BBC Two at 7pm and on Sunday afternoon on BBC One. But we start this evening with Sue Baker. For Britain, the most important new car in the show must be the Rover 200, the latest product of the collaboration with Honda that we looked at last week. The old 200 was Rover's version of the Honda Ballard, and this car is also being built in Britain as the Honda Concerto. Here's Chris Goffey. Now, while it's a joint development, this is very much a Rover in its own right. The engineers have been closely involved in all details of the design from the very first clean sheet of paper. And indeed, the cars built here are significantly different to the concertos built and sold in Japan. The new Rover range comprises two distinct variants, the 214 and the 216. But under the very similar skin, they're very different creatures. Under the bonnet of the 214 is the Rover Group's new K-series engine. Now, on paper, this is a, a pretty exotic specification. Twin overhead camshafts, 16 valves and fuel injection. But in fact, it sets new industry standards for engine design. It's actually composed of the head, block and sump, and all three elements are held together by ten long bolts that run the entire length of the engine. That makes for a very rigid and long-lasting unit. They say that the hydraulic tappets will require no attention and the camshaft belt should last for at least 100,000 miles before it needs renewing. The whole unit is mated to Rover's own version of a Peugeot gearbox. Develops 95 brake horsepower from its 1.4 litres and that's enough to give it very good performance against its competitors. But under the bonnet of the 216, things are very different. This is the Honda 1.6 engine that we've already seen in the Civic. It's a 16-valve unit, develops 116 brake horsepower, and that's enough to give the car a maximum speed of 120 miles an hour. Now, because Honda engines turn in a different direction to the K-series, they've had to pick the whole unit up, turn it right round in the engine bay, and, of course, the gearbox is now over on the driver's side. But it's a very reliable and well-established unit. Shouldn't give any problems at all. The real attraction of these new Rovers, though, is inside. Inside, Rover are very keen to promote the luxury limousine image in the 200 with the look-alike walnut and leather. Seats are very comfortable based on the 800 design with height adjustment. The seat belts move up and down the pillar to suit all sizes of occupants. The obvious change at the back from the old model is that this is a, a hatchback series. Unfortunately, they put the spare wheel under the boot floor, so you've got to unload everything to get at it, and that's a pity, I think. But that said, it's uh, quite a big boot with the asymmetric split rear seat in place, 12.4 cubic feet, and with everything folded down, you've got over 42 cubic feet, and that's better than almost anything else in the class. Let's see how they go on the road. Rover say the 214 will be the volume seller of the range. There are three versions of the car, the SI, the SLI and the GSI. Prices, well, they range from 8,700 to just under 10,500. There's two option packs and a long list of extras. The K-Series engine in this 214 at first acquaintance is a little bit disappointing. It doesn't have the fire you'd expect from a twin cam unit, but it's very smooth and very free revving. Instrument layout, well, that's quite classical in its design. Nice black instruments with white figures and the controls very well placed. The 214 does score in ride and handling. It takes potholes and poor surfaces without bottoming, and yet it's tight enough to cope with spirited cornering. I found the standard steering rather heavy, and I'd certainly want the excellent power steering, a 300-pound option. And anti-lock brakes are 900 pounds extra too. 
as you'd expect the 11,000 pound 216 GSI handles pretty much the same as the 214 but when you put your foot down the response is very different. Although it's just 200 cc's bigger the engine in the 216 transforms the car it feels very lively and certainly a, a real performance machine. Rover are very keen to point out that it's a, a driver's car both the 214 and the 216 have very high levels of road holding they're very easy to drive and they're very safe. So what's the competition for the new 200? Well, Rover are setting their sights high. They talk about BMW, Volvo and Peugeot as rival manufacturers. But they'll admit that their target car when they were designing the new 200 was Volkswagen's Golf and Jetta. They say they're looking for aspiring young professionals as customers, although they acknowledge there's a healthy market amongst older buyers looking to move down from big luxury cars in their retirement. But what they have to do, above all else, is get the 200 onto company car drivers' shopping lists because they account for over a third of all sales in this market. Well, it's been a long time coming, but here's the car we've all been waiting to see, the new Lotus Elan, designed to re-establish a British presence in the small sports car market. The old Elan was renowned for its super handling and its understated styling. Well, you couldn't call this one understated. The Elan is the first front-wheel drive car in Lotus's 41-year history. It comes in two versions, both with a 1.6-litre, 16-valve twin-cam engine. This is the more powerful SE, turbocharged to 165 brake horsepower and capable of 137 miles an hour. The Elan's dearer than expected. This version's going to be almost 20,000 pounds. So it looks less a natural successor to the original Elan than the car which is an honest copy, Mazda's Miata MX-5, which we showed you recently in California. We shall, of course, be testing the lovely Elan, but not, it seems, until next spring. Now to a matter of considerable public concern, namely the question of the standard of police driving. Over the past couple of years, we've become accustomed to headlines like these. The figures for the past two years, the only ones available, show how big the problem is. In 1987, 24 civilians and eight police officers were killed, and literally hundreds were seriously injured. Last year, the figures were broadly similar, and this year there seems to be very little improvement. So what action should the police take? Tom Boswell takes up the story. This is no practice chase. The motorist has already been told to stop several times by the West Midlands police. It's their camera which recorded this pursuit. In this busy urban area, it's the police who must decide whether it's safe to continue the chase. There's a school down here. Be very, very careful. Right. Yes, it's on the wrong side of the traffic island. Dias Road. Yeah, carrying on Dias Road. Yes, we're on to King Standing Road, the wrong side of the dual carriageway in the face of oncoming... But is their training for these situations enough, and could they be better prepared? Yeah, Binstead Road, they've abandoned it. Binstead Road, over. The Association of Chief Police Officers responding to public concern over police chases issued the Police Driving Report. It made 29 recommendations to improve police driving. Recommendation 10 said the manual, that's Roadcraft, should be revised by the National Police Driving Schools Conference. The system of car control was designed um, by advisors to the Metropolitan Police in 1934 and has been the core of driver training for the police and other advanced drivers since that date. OK, it was appropriate in 1934 to the driving conditions and the technology of that day, but was no longer um, appropriate to uh, modern, dynamic driving conditions. Uh, and that seemed to be what was causing the problem. Sir John Whitmore, British and European saloon champion of the 60s, maintains that roadcraft and the system taught by the police is not just wrong, it's dangerous. Roadcraft describes a very rigid system. It's very much a right-wrong. It, it opens with a, a system of driving that has to be followed in sequence. And it doesn't allow for the creative initiative that is required to be a good driver. And if you learn by rote to do things in a certain order, it doesn't allow you to have the flexibility that's necessary to be a responsive driver. 
One area that he is gravely concerned about is the method taught to hold the steering wheel. Roadcraft states that the hands should be placed in a 10 to 2 position when driving. It's actually a cumbersome way to steer and um, more importantly than that perhaps, um, it is a slower way to steer if you're responding to a skid on ice, for example, and you have to respond quickly with steering. It's much better and quicker to keep your hands on the steering wheel fixed in a fixed position. This theory has recently been supported by work done here in Cambridge. They've proved the 10 to 2 position with the hands near the top of the wheel is outdated, inefficient and tiring. I think people should be encouraged on long drives to use a 25 to 5 position with part of the weight taken on their, their thighs but still leaving plenty of freedom of movement. Uh, so that is, is one criticism. The other one is that if you actually compare driver's control of a vehicle, as I've done in a, in a simulator, allowing people to use a, hand, a method of moving the hand through the 12 o'clock position and then pulling down on one side of the wheel or on the other side, rather than the uh, 10 to 2 and the push-pull method, then in fact uh, experienced drivers uh, keep a much better course uh, than if they're constrained to the push-pull method. A skid is the most dangerous situation that police officers can find themselves in. Roadcraft teaches them to eliminate the cause by relaxing the accelerator or brakes. But this isn't always the quickest way of regaining control. This is the declutch method. It's contrary to roadcraft, but now taught by the West Midlands police, following the methods taught to Scandinavian officers. It works by taking the drive off the wheels. Whether that car is rear wheel, front wheel, or four wheel driven, the drive is removed, so every car then behaves in the identical manner. If you don't take the drive off, each individual car behaves in a different way when it develops a skid. For the last two years, every student through the West Midland Police Driving School has been taught this method on the skid frames. This has led in a reduction by over 30% on our loss of control accidents in the last two years. But it's not just driving techniques that can be improved. What about the mental approach? Superintendent Peter Amy of the Kent Constabulary has looked at the psychological aspects of driving under pressure. I would make the core of driver training mental approach, mental attitude, to get people to think about what they've just done, to think about what effect it had on other drivers. So I looked at um, the accidents in my own force and found that roughly 20% of accidents were caused in the what I would call the high stress situation which is pursuit or going to a call and that was um, mainly caused to the driver either exceeding his own capabilities or the capabilities of the vehicle or the road you know going too fast in the conditions. David Brady is one who recognizes this. He had chased a car which had caused two serious accidents. As he approached and faced the offending driver, he found to his horror that he completely lost his self-control. This in spite of being a very experienced police driver. I didn't even think about the psychological stress. When it was over, I thought, oh God, what have I done? You know, what made me behave like that? And that is when I thought that the job should institute some sort of psychological training or psychological interviewing which would help a bloke who's in my situation, and they don't, and they haven't. The police must always be in a position to respond. This is the Warwickshire police filming an 18-year-old driver in a stolen car doing up to 130 miles an hour. There may be disagreements amongst police forces as to how best to improve their training and driving, but as Sir John Whitmore says, they went to the sporting drivers in the 30s, so why don't they return to them now to learn the techniques best suited to modern cars? And they must look too at the mental and psychological pressures of driving if all chases are to be safely concluded, as indeed this one was. Well, we wait to see what kind of response is forthcoming from the Home Office on what is clearly an important issue. Now, on a somewhat lighter note, back to Sue. It's not only new cars at Motor Fair. This lovely collection of old ones are all for sale. They're going to come under the hammer at an auction here next week. Well, usually the only time you'd see such cars on the road is in specialist rallies. And almost every weekend, somewhere around the country, enthusiasts are out in their treasured vehicles. Cars, vans, even buses. 
Each year, the Ribble Enthusiast Club meet at a car park in Southport and drive to Blackpool Seafront. Tony Mason was there, hopping on and off buses all the way. Famous names, many from an era long gone, on carriages that once took workers to factory and farm and conveyed gracious ladies to afternoon tea at the Imperial. There's over 60 years of nostalgia here at Southport as bus enthusiasts of every age are being flagged away by the mayoral party. Now, bus enthusiasts enjoy their old vehicles, but surprisingly, they also drool over modern ones like this brand new Olympian double-decker. But the difference is that these are much easier to drive. No gears, just a lot of knobs and buttons. So, off we go. They came in all shapes and sizes. We passed a film star from all creatures great and small, a 30s Ribble Tiger, a post-war London omnibus, and the very first Atlantean. But I had to leave the newest for the oldest, the Leyland Lion. It was built uh, in 1927, and uh, this vehicle was one of an order of 34, uh, actually ordered by Ribble between uh, February and March in 1927. And this vehicle, uh, when it was new, cost the uh, sum of £1,407. It's now worth 100 times that amount and is still pride of the Ribble fleet. Rebuilt by the firm's apprentices, the Lion's still licensed to carry fair-paying passengers. One of the most popular buses ever is this superb Bedford OB. Well, I think it filled a need just after the war for a reasonably light vehicle, which was uh, not cheap to buy, easy to maintain. And they just got this reputation for reliability. Uh, before we got it, it had been used for 10 years on a, a bee picking farm for carrying the workers back and forwards to the field. <laughs> so like, it was in a pretty poor condition when we started on it. The body was literally sort of hanging off it, you know. Now it's in immaculate condition. Norman's craftsmanship is superb and everything's authentic. It's built to last another hundred years, but I can only guarantee it for the first 50. After that, it'll have to take its own time. No, I didn't drive all the way. There's only one way to arrive in Blackpool, and that's on an open top double decker. This splendid 1965 PD2 comes from Southport and it's unusual because it spent all its life there. In the 70s there were lots of changes in the bus business when companies amalgamated and buses moved areas. But not this one, it stayed in Southport. So today is a very rare outing for it to foreign shores. The Leyland Tiger on PS1 coach with duple bodywork in the delivery of Maypole coaches. Uh, regrettably not displaying an entry number, but then being followed by entry number S1, which is a vehicle that was once a bus, but is no longer. As you can see, it's a, a breakdown vehicle, and behind that, the vehicle was the rather accumulated... So these are pretty pricey. Do they sell well? Uh, very well, yes. yes. Which is the most popular? Uh, today, I think it's after to be the new, new range of models uh, just come out. Probably the best seller today, that was. Ah, the Leyland Tiger Cub. I understand yeah. it's the only one left running in the world. Fabulous. But they're not just here for the sake of it, there's the serious business of silverware. The 1950 Bedford OB model with Jupiter bodywork of Charles and Preston. We don't expect to sort of uh, win anything at these things, but when you're out, up with four cooks, but I think uh, the main one is the best mechanically maintained vehicle. So that's the, uh, I think that's, that's the one for me. Uh, Jaguar's fortunes over the past year have been strongly tied to the fluctuations of the pound against the dollar. Desperately low profits have of course led to talk of takeover, with Ford now set to increase their stake to 15%, they're already at 10%. Although Jaguar Sir John Egan says he wants to remain independent, the company is still negotiating with the other major predator, General Motors, so it could develop into a real tug of war. Meanwhile, the company is showing here their updated XJ6, and since we saw it at Frankfurt, Chris has had a chance to see just how well it goes.
three years on from the introduction of their highly successful XJ6 range, Jaguar have announced some major improvements to the cars. Principle is the change to the engine. The all aluminium 24 valve unit goes up from 3.6 to 4 litres, gets substantially more power, more torque, which is developed lower down the rev range and thus 140 mile an hour improved performance. And Jaguar claim there's no real penalty in fuel consumption. That's in part due to a new automatic transmission. It's a four-speed ZF unit and it features an electronic control to smooth the up changes. Jaguar have kept their famous J selector control. That means you can manually select gears, but in automatic mode, it's also now got a, a sport setting. That means you can kick down at higher engine speeds and it'll also keep the engine spinning right round to the red line on the rev counter if you're in a hurry. All XJ6s have anti-lock brakes as standard now with a, a new system from the German TV's company. Inside the car, the other principal change is to the dashboard. Now that's in direct response to the American market. The Americans love Jaguar's leather and walnut, but they don't like the electronic dash panel. We can buy that from the Japanese, they say. What we want from Jaguar is traditional handcrafted quality. So they've gone back in this car to al almost old-fashioned black dials with white letters and needles. And very nice they look too. In fact, the, the whole package adds up to that old slogan of Jaguar's, grace, space and pace, which they've never really improved on. Now for a sportier version, this is the latest result of collaboration between Jaguar and Tom Walkinshaw, the XJR 4 litre announced here at the show. It joins the Jaguar Sport version of the XJS, now with a 6 litre V12 engine. On the circuits this year, Jaguar have been defending their World Sports Prototype Championship with the sort of car that Tiffany Dell drove for Top Gear in the spring. But it's up against some stiff competition from the Japanese, from Mercedes and from the various private Porsche teams. Well, Becky Adams has been looking at the sort of testing that goes on between races in a major sports car team. Well, it's 8 o'clock on a sunny morning in August. We're here at Silverstone South Circuit with Richard Lloyd's Porsche team. Our man Tiffany Dow is just about to put the car through its paces. Tiff, what are you hoping to learn from today? Well, really, Becky, it's two parts. There's the continuous program of developing the car, making it that little bit faster. But also, we've just returned from the Nürburgring where we had uh, braking problems. So we've got to specifically look at our brakes and try and get them better. Also, we've got the car mounted up with some tyre temperature sensors to monitor that. As soon as the circuit opened at 10 o'clock, I was sent out in the newer black Porsche 962 to test various ways of keeping the brakes cool, particularly important for the next race at Donington with its heavy demand on braking. On Silverstone's hangar straight, we added an extra chicane, and with appropriate gearing and suspension settings, the flat airfield does duty for the swooping curves of Donington Park. Lap after lap through the morning, I have to drive in exactly the same way so as to show up the effect of the engineer's adjustments and each of those laps has to be just on the limit. It doesn't always work. So, Tiff, you uh, span off. What actually happened? Oh, it's just that it's a handy problem we have when the tyres get hot sometimes, that it, it oversteers into very tight corners and that was a, a classic case we've seen now of, of terminal oversteer into a tight corner so, uh, but you always have to push right to those limits when testing to get a feel of what the car really does at the limit is there anything that can be done about it or is it just uh, more careful driving next time no no you always try and change the car you try to stay driving as hard as possible and uh, the team of mechanics now will try a suspension change or a wing change, aerodynamic change, so that I can drive in the same manner but go through the corner at that speed. A full My teammate this year is former world sports car champion Derek Bell, five times winner at Le Mans, always in Porsches, most recently in a 962. It's a classic car now, really. I mean, it's been around a lot of years. It handles very well. But of course, technology has overtaken us with the other manufacturers coming in a bit now, and we're having a bit of a struggle to keep up. But the car basically is a very neutral handling car. Uh, the power is very sweet, very nice sort of power. The car has no vices. It's never had any vices at all. 
Throughout the day, it's out for a few laps testing, then back to the pits to tell team manager Ian Dawson how the car is affected by the latest modification. There's also some bumps right on the apex, which unsettle it. So even if you go in neutral... Does it, does it feel like it unloads in the rear? You, know, you get a sort of an unloading sensation. Well, that's what I'm thinking. It looks a little bit the like it here. The high speed as well, it's unloaded. So it lifts itself. Yeah. It's like so what are you actually gaining from this little computer printout? That's... What this does is it gives you all the temperatures while the car's running. Uh -huh. um, as you make changes, you can, uh, you know, Wayne's using the box, the BM2000, and this would basically extract all the information from the engine. Um, if we make adjustments in there, this will show up whether the water temperature's higher or lower, whether one gets affected, the oil's higher or lower. It records fuel temperature, revs in the engine. Once more, a constant pace is essential, so that any changes in the printout are due only to the engineer's experiments, and not to my pushing the engine harder. By one o'clock, after around 35 laps, there's time before lunch to assess performance so far. Yeah, well, we now have temperatures from the steel brakes. We've got our chicane in to, to be like a Donington circuit where we are next, so we've got temperatures from the steel brakes. Again, we're monitoring them all the time because it was the steel brakes we had problems with. Now we'll try the carbon brakes and see what temperature we get on them. Having asked Tiff uh, what he was going to do with the car, really, it's not up to the, the driver. Really, the whole secret of testing, of being a great driver, is being able to put over to your engineer, in this case Ian Dawson, what is happening to the car, and any changes he does on the car is being able to put it over to him saying that was, that was better or that was worse. Two o'clock, and I was ready to try out the red car, fitted with the much lighter carbon fiber brake discs and pads. Now in attendance, checking up on our progress, the captain, team owner Richard Lloyd. My job is to put together all, all the resources, the human resources, the, the material, uh, obviously sponsors, um, and just make sure that we keep it running in the right sort of, right sort of way to attract future um, cooperation from manufacturers and sponsors alike. It's, if you like, a sort of producer's job of getting all the elements together. And getting all those elements together costs a lot of money, and a private team runs on a shoestring compared to the works. Testing days are a luxury, so did I think we'd had a successful day? Yes, half and half. Uh, unfortunately, the guy, the specialist to do the tyre temperatures couldn't make it, so we didn't run that experiment today. But uh, we run the carbon brakes, we've now got the temperatures down on them, so they're working, so we think we might be able to use them for the next race. So, do you stand any chance of winning? Yes, we're still up against, although we're up against million pound major manufacturers, you know, we're now in a good condition for Donington and uh, there's always a chance of winning. Well, sadly, Donington proved to be something of a disaster for Tiff. He had an engine blown practice and Mercedes clinched the World Championship. So now there's only the final run in Mexico in 10 days' time for the Richard Lloyd team to end the year on a high note. That's really all from Motor Fair on Top Gear. We do, however, have a special program going out tomorrow evening. You can join Noel Edmonds, Janet Ellis and Chris Goffey at 7pm on BBC Two. That's where we'll be next week as well. For one program only, we're going out on Friday at 7pm with Becky Adam investigating some more fast machinery when she goes drag racing. Chris Goffey visits the remarkable Schlumpf Museum in France. We report on the perils of buying a new car. So see you next week, Friday, 7pm. Until then, drive safely and good night. <laughs>